Nigerians expressed the satisfaction of the federal government's cashless policy. Senior lawyer Femi Falano holds the Nigerian army to court over planned Operation Positive Identification. In international news, ISIL confirms death of al-Baghdadi, names new leader. And in sport, International Athletics Federation strips Oyesha Day or Latoye of her gold and bronze medals. I am Olajumoke Olatunji. Nigerians are not happy with the federal government's cashless policy. They say it is creating more problems rather than solving existing ones. A central bank recently started implementing the cashless policy and that has brought about imposition of new tariffs on individual electronic transactions, including points of sales. Many Nigerians are groaning about the different ways in which these new charges have affected their pocketbooks. Some say they may actually be encouraged to operate in cash to avoid what they consider to be punishment for purchases made through their bank accounts. Many say this is the wrong time to introduce such a policy because, as they put it, there are too many poor and hungry citizens across the country that should be helped rather than taxed further for electronically using their money. The social media has been awash with comments on the new policy, most of them negative. The Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, has suspended its proposed strike. The union is opposed to a federal government directive to enroll its members in the integrated payroll personnel information system. ASU President Professor Biodung Ogunyemi said on Thursday the union will maintain status quo while it awaits results from further meetings. There are reports that President Muhammad Buhari had warned during his budget presentation last month the federal government's employees not captured on the IPPIS platform by October the 31st would no longer be receiving their salaries. Professor Guiemi says the union will propose another plan that would include unique areas of the universities and promote their interests. Senior advocate of Nigeria, Femi Falano, is suing the Nigerian army. Its chief of army staff and the attorney general of the federation at the federal high court in Lagos over the military's planned operation positive identification. Falano has described the military's planned nationwide operation as unconstitutional, illegal, null and void and a violation of the rights of citizens. Falano is also seeking an interim junction to restrain the army from implementing the plan until his main lawsuit has been heard. The Dependent National Electoral Commission, INEX, says it would create additional polling units by the first quarter of next year. INEC National Commissioner and Chairman Information and Voter Education Committee, Festo Sokoye, made the announcement on Thursday in Abuja during a dialogue session at the Niger Civil Society Situation Room. Okoye said the commission would consult with critical partners in decisions to create additional polling units and adjust constituencies. It said, the current and, okay, sorry, it said the current ad hoc procedures of creating voting points and voting point settlements would no longer work for the commission, as they are merely stopgap measures. Okoye said the commission would also collaborate with the National Assembly and the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation to reform the electoral legal framework. The drum beats are sounding louder these days for 2023 presidential candidacies of Ashiwaju Ahmed Bolatinubu, national leader of the All Progressives Congress, and Kaduna State Governor Nasir El Rafai. The Progressives Governors Forum, consisting of All Progressives Governors, APC Governors, has addressed the desire of former Lagos State Governor Bola Ahmed Tinubu and current Kaduna State Governor Nasir El Rafai to succeed President Muhammad Buhari in 2023. In fact, some support groups have swung into action by opening 2023 presidential campaign offices for Tinumbu, El Rafai and other potential candidates, even though none of their principals have publicly declared an intention to run. During a question and answer session after the meeting on Thursday, Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwolu said both men have the right to seek power. 
Dozens of shops and millions of Naira worth of property were raised by an inferno on Thursday at the Maiduguri GSM market. Banu State Governor Babaga Nazulum has ordered an investigation. Special Advisor to the Governor on Public Relations and Strategy, Issa Guze, has said in a statement on Friday that the Governor had directed commissioners whose ministries relate to commerce, home affairs, poverty alleviation and jobs creation to assess damage, interact with respondents, victims and other relevant persons and generate an immediate report that would guide the Governor's action. Guza said Governor Zulum shares the pains of those whose means of livelihood and assets were consumed by the fire. Coming up, African stories. Rescue and relief efforts underway after torrential rains in Central African Republic. And later, international news. ISIL confirms death of al-Baghdadi, names new leader. Dear mommy. You went out that night with the baby in your tummy, but you did not come back. The baby is very fat and she eats and sleeps a lot. Everyone says that you are in a better place, but I miss you so much. I keep asking them, where is the better place, but nobody answers me. Auntie Kami just hugs me and says go and play mommy i miss you please when are you coming home i still do miss you mom and in honor of your memory i'm a doctor today working with the mtn foundation to save mothers and children every day ending mother and child mortality in nigeria is dear to us we will keep strengthening this most important bond just for you Welcome back. This is ANN News, now to African stories. Relief operation in CAR for 28,000 flood victims has continued after torrential rains made thousands of people homeless across several provinces in the Central African Republic and, and an additional 8,000 in the capital, Bongi. Reports say it continues to rain almost every day, causing severe flooding in the Central African Republic and the level of the Bongi River, which serves as the border between CAR and the Democratic Republic of Congo, continues to rise. In the nation's capital, the south and southwest are mostly affected. The Red Cross says more than 8,000 people are affected there. Their homes are either swallowed up by the water or partially destroyed. Many have already moved to families a temporary shelter provided by the authorities. Prime Minister Fermin Gribade on Tuesday explained the situation had worsened following the overflow of the Wagidi River, located in the southwest of the capital. He then appealed for international support. The Democratic Republic of Congo's army says it has launched an offensive against militia groups waging war in the country's east. A military spokesman, General Richard Kasungo, says the aim was to eradicate all domestic and foreign groups that had destabilized the eastern region for nearly 30 years. He says the operation that was launched from Beni, North Kivu province, bordering Uganda and Rwanda, has seen rebel positions being shelled. He added that ground troops had been engaged. The Ugandan armed group, the Allied Democratic Forces, targeted North Kivu area, killing hundreds of people. Five countries in the region, including the DR Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and Tanzania, agreed last week to combine their military operations to tackle cross border insecurity. And five Rwandan companies have packed their wares, goods, and products ready to participate in the second China International Import Expo. A Rwandan official has described the expo as a golden opportunity to showcase Rwandan exports to the Chinese market. Rwanda plans to showcase its coffee, pepper and handcraft. Head of Communications and Marketing at Rwandan Development Board, Sani Tompiamba, said his country is looking to trade more with the Chinese market. 2019 will be the second year Diego participates in the expo. Scenes from last year's successful exhibition are still fresh in Diego's mind. The last uh, China Import Expo uh, took place in Shanghai in November 2018. Uh, it opened us uh, so many opportunity because we, we saw another world of opportunity 
because uh, we've been also selling to Europe and uh, India. We didn't know about Chinese market. For us, we see that there's another big market to consider. Uh, and for us, we were lucky because we, uh, when we, we attend that exhibition, we've managed to get a big contract of, to export chili oil to China. The value was about two, two million US dollar. And it shows like how uh, uh, China market is big and uh, it can benefit for, for us. A total of 172 countries, ranging from international organizations to enterprises, were at the first CIIE in November last year. The event opened up vast opportunities to Rwandan farms. The platform paved the way for array of Rwandan products to be showcased at the lucrative Chinese market. Signing that first contract, I attended, I because I, I saw the opportunity in Chinese market. I went back in some other exhibition and I've gotten so many other opportunities. At the moment, Rwanda's trade focused with the world's second biggest economy is at a solid growth. To take advantage of this, a handful of Rwandan farms are eyeing to seal export deals with major trade partners such as Alibaba. The difference of uh, Chinese market with other markets we've been supplying to is that they, they buy so many volume, so much volume. If they, if they import, for example, for a big volume from a country, that, that, that's beneficial to the whole nation. Because uh, if, you, for example, they are importing my chili, I, I will give so many contracts to many auto growers. So it will impact um, a large number of farmers because we'll be assured of the market. I think that is a, a good policy because uh, they're going to empower African uh, uh, countries to increase their exports. Yeah, because it, China is a big market for uh, African countries. Coffee, tea, flowers and avocados are just some of the African farm produce that will be marketed at the second edition of the CIIE in Shanghai. Over 3,000 enterprises from about 150 countries and regions will be at the week-long expo. Ethiopia has agreed to a mediation talks led by the United States to resolve an existing disagreement with Egypt over the construction of a dam. Several other rounds of talks held in Egypt and Sudan have failed to resolve the dispute. The U.S. offer to arbitrate the meeting with neighboring Sudan and Egypt was earlier rejected. Ethiopia says it would not be influenced by outsiders meddling on the building of the 6,000 megawatts Grand Renaissance Dam. Egypt, which relies on the Nile for 90% of its water, is worried that the dam will greatly affect its already scarce water supply. Ethiopia also accused Egypt last week of trying to maintain a grip over the Nile waters using the colonial era treaty. Now, an Ethiopian government spokesman says Foreign Affairs Minister of Ethiopia, Egypt and Sudan will meet in Washington for the crunch talks, but a date is yet to be set. When we return, international news. ISIL confirms death of al Baghdadi, names new leader. And later, sports. International Athletics Federation strips Oye Shade or Latoye of her gold and bronze medals. Welcome back. This is ANN News on the foreign scene. The Islamic State of Iraq has announced its new leader, Abu Ibrahim al Hashimi. Days after the Islamic State leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and his heir apparent were killed in back-to-back -back attacks by United States forces in northern Syria. The Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant Armed Group has also confirmed the death of its leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. The seven minutes statements did not provide any other details about the new leader, but the message called on the group's followers to pledge allegiance to the new leader, whose title indicates that he claims descent from the tribe of Prophet Muhammad. The audio recording uploaded on Telegram was the first word from the Islamic State confirming the death of its leader, which President Trump triumphantly announced on Sunday as a huge blow to the world's most fearsome terrorist group. Under al-Baghdadi's command, ISIL became one of the most brutal armed groups in modern history and at its peak, its self-declared caliphate covered territory across Iraq and Syria, roughly equivalent to the size of the United Kingdom. A U.S. House of Representatives took a major step in the effort to impeach President Donald Trump when lawmakers approved rules for the next more public stage in the Democratic-led inquiry into Trump's attempt to have Ukraine investigate a domestic political rival. 
In the first formal test of support for the impeachment investigation, the Democratic-controlled House voted almost entirely along party lines, 232 to 196, to move the probe forward in Congress. The vote allows for public impeachment hearings in Congress, which are expected in the coming weeks. Republicans accused the Democrats of using impeachment to overturn the results of his 2016 election victory. Trump told a UK radio station the Democrats knew they were losing next year's vote and so were trying to take him down. The House is investigating whether Trump abused the powers of his office by orchestrating a pressure campaign on Ukraine for domestic personal political gain. Experts at an international symposium on China-U.S. economic ties in Singapore are urging the U.S. and China to avoid a zero-sum game and seek common ground to benefit Asia and the world. Reporter Wang Hu was at the symposium. China-U.S. trade war, other nations are focusing on bilateral economic ties between the two. This is the focus of a symposium hosted by think tanks from both countries and from Singapore. About 80 delegates from 10 nations are discussing key issues on this matter, especially the current trade war. Singapore's Emeritus Senior Minister Go Chok Tong spoke at the opening ceremony of the event. An all-out conflict between the U.S. and China would be disastrous not only for Asia but for the world. He feels the best way forward is to forge a common cause for the two nations. To borrow a term from Danny Kwa of uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, our common cause is to get the U.S. and China to play a positive sum game and not a zero sum game. Former Chinese Vice Premier Zeng Peiyan talked about the harm of some people's proposals of decoupling China. From the macroeconomic perspective, decoupling will benefit neither oneself nor others. It will lead to a man-made breakdown of the global value chain. It doesn't comply with the trends or features of the era of the digital economy and damages the global supply of public goods. Zeng says, China and the U.S. both enjoy important positions in the global supply chain, industrial chain, and the value chain. If one forcefully gets out of the systems, they will hurt the other as well as itself. For instance, the U.S. threatens to cut off the supply of chips to Huawei. It seems like a blow only to Huawei, but actually it has gravely undermined American companies, such as Qualcomm, Broadcom, and Intel, which supply chips to Huawei. Zeng says China doesn't intend to challenge the U.S., neither does it want to take the place of the U.S. The U.S. can't control China, nor can it stop China's development. Both countries have their own development goals, but it doesn't mean it has to be a zero-sum game. Instead, both countries can complement and reinforce one another. China's three-state mobile operators have switched on the world's largest 5G network in what has been described as a watershed moment for mobile technology. With more than 1 billion active subscriptions, the country is the world's largest mobile market. Chen Yubin reports that in Shanghai, nearly 12,000 5G base stations have been activated to support 5G coverage across the city's key outdoor areas. An initiation ceremony on China's 5G commercialization. It was attended by the nation's major telecom giants and hundreds of international participants. China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology says China will use this opportunity to accelerate the construction of an efficient nationwide 5G network. We will quicken the pace of innovation in 5G's applications in industry, transportation, energy, and agriculture, and explore and cultivate new models, products, and commercial activities. China's first 5G mobile packages by its three main telecom giants were unveiled during this expo. Prices start from 129 yuan per month for 30 gigabytes, and a package plan for as much as 300 gigabytes costs 599 yuan, and each gigabyte beyond subscribe usage only costs 3 yuan. To suit the commercialization and future applications, 130,000 5G base stations will be built by the end of this year in more than 50 Chinese cities, and more are expected next year. 
and 5G signals will eventually reach all cities in China. China Tower has carried out the main construction projects of 5G base stations for all three major telecom giants in China and will finish the set tasks for 2019 by the end of the year. China's latest developments in 5G and related industries are on display during the flagship 5G event held from Thursday to Sunday. There are more about applications than just basic studies in recent years. Like what we have incorporated with mining, medical treatment, smart traveling and intelligent manufacturing, that shows that 5G technologies have seen large applications in China. And there are challenges. Besides the network, we will have to make concerted efforts in the applications of terminal modules and even in industry standards that will prompt us to integrate the whole industry in the days to come. More than 60,000 people have registered to attend this expo, and they will discuss opportunities and challenges in the era of 5G. With the commercialization of 5G technology, more applications and conveniences are on the way, and it's expected its potential will be seen very soon. Up next, sports. International Athletics Federation strips Oye Shade Olatoye of her gold and bronze medals. Please stay with us. Welcome back. This is ANN News in Sport. Oye Shade Olatoye has been stripped of her gold and bronze medals won at the recent African Games held in Morocco by International Association of Athletics Federation. The 22 year old was not cleared by IAAF's Nationality Review Panel to represent Nigeria at the continental showpiece, thereby annulling her result. Olatoye, who is the 2019 Ohio State Female Athlete of the Year, was born in the USA in 1997, but opted to represent Nigeria in 2019. Rule 5 of the IAAF competition indicates Olatoye was eligible to represent Nigeria in national representative competitions from September 2019, but was at the African Games which was held in August. If her appeal is not successful, Olatoye would have to cede her gold medal to Ishkir Senegal of South Africa. A FIFA has found Chelsea guilty of a total of 150 breaches of rules involving 71 players. Chelsea received their FIFA transfer ban because they failed to register overseas minors over multiple seasons. The Blues are still awaiting a date for their appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, where they hope to get the green light suspend again in January. FIFA's findings show the football body simply dismissed many of the club's arguments by pointing to the sheer number of youth games played by some of the players. That is in the news this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, annafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. I am Olajimo Keolatiji. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>